A lot of my research focuses around making uh, infrastructure visible and especially the people who are involved in developing and shaping and planning and actually building infrastructures that are often left unseen or left um, invisible. And this is tying into sustainable development goal number nine, which is build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization, uh, foster and foster innovation. Uh, so I'll start with talking about, you can see that Google map image there, uh, Ovuyavik, which is actually the northernmost community uh, in Quebec, in the Nunavik region. It's about 2,000 kilometers north of Montreal. So there's actually a photo I took up there. So you can see it's in a bay. You can see some icebergs there. The uh, Inuktitut name for the community is the place where ice accumulates because of strong flows of water. When I was standing there um, watching this, you could actually see the icebergs flowing in and out of the bay there. Um, this is a very small community. Uh, there's uh, about 400 people there, uh, 414 in the 2016 census. People are still uh, living off the land there, so they go and uh, gather eggs from the Murray Apac birds. Uh, they hunt beluga whales and walrus. Um, so they're doing a lot of these uh, cultural activities as well, and they've been doing this for thousands of years in this space. When we talk about infrastructure in communities like Avuyavik, and the north of Canada is filled with these communities, there's many uh, small population dispersed communities. You know, when we think about transportation infrastructure, it's much different than what we have here uh, in urban sort of Edmonton, right? So a lot of these communities, um, you know, they're fly-in communities. Some may have winter road access. Avuyavik does not. You have to fly in and out. Uh, in the summertime, there's a sea barge that comes and delivers uh, food and other goods. Um, as well, electricity, they're not connected to the same electrical grid we are here. Um, there's, they're reliant on burning diesel for energy. That image there is actually what the locals call the Canadian Tire. So they'll go there and get pieces to repair like their vehicles, skidoos, ATVs, that kind of stuff. And communications infrastructure, which is what I'll really focus on today, is very different than what we're used to here uh, in the south. This image is actually from the annual communications monitoring report, which is released by the Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunications Commission of Canada. That's the big regulatory body that takes a look at uh, what communication services are available to people in Canada. And you can see there that there's a big kind of hole, there's a gap there in the three northern territories. People there cannot access what's now the new standard for connectivity of 50 megabytes per second down and 10 up with unlimited data plans. That's not actually available there according to uh, recent statistics. How about affordability? Um, what does it cost to access internet there? Well, you can see there as well, it's the most expensive place in Canada to get online, especially in the rural communities, so the smaller communities in the territories. It's by far the most expensive. It's saying there $111 per month, but you can see it's all like edging out to that higher cost. How about public access centers, going to Starbucks, you know, getting online there, going to the library? Well, you can see there that the smallest figure for free internet as well um, is actually aggregated um, the Atlantic Canada provinces as well as the north. Uh, that's just 2% of the available free internet access. Uh, we can't say that it's smaller populations there, but you have to think of the, the range of uh, communities that are covered there and the size of both Atlantic Canada and the north. In a nutshell, it's slow, it's expensive, and there's not a lot of even free public access up there. Um, so this leads to what researchers are talking about is a bit of a geographic paradox for telecom development. Um, so you have urban communities like here in Edmonton where you get typically the fastest, cheapest, best services available, but you don't have as much uh, interest or need for them uh, because here we can come to the university, we can take a class here, we can go to a walk-in clinic, we can see a doctor there, um, you know, we can go to Costco and you know, buy a bunch of chips or whatever we need to buy. So we have a lot more brick and mortar services uh, that are available in person here versus in these remote uh, northern communities that um, often people are using uh, internet to access uh, these types of public services. Uh, so essentially there's a higher need for uh, teleservices, but they're more expensive and they're less accessible. But I do want to point out that if we just focus on those challenges, you know, this, this deficiency, uh, that there is a lack of infrastructure in the north, uh, we're not really talking about the assets, the community champions, the work and innovation that's being done by people in the north. Uh, so most of my presentation, I'm going to focus on that, where people are, um, you know, in these small areas, really um, literally building those aspects of infrastructure themselves. Um, so we do need to acknowledge those structural challenges, but also identify all the uh, innovation that is happening in these communities. 
Um, so just uh, going back to Avuyevic, uh, you can see there it's it's actually a really high tech place. You know, you have uh, healthcare services being offered over telemedicine. Uh, that's a nurse practitioner who would actually do remote diagnoses, working with doctors in uh, different areas uh, within in Quebec to do. Um, you know, diagnoses using stethoscopes, uh, cameras, etc. Uh, in education, um, in a lot of these regions, they're actually using the internet to have high school classes. So, uh, for example, in Northwest Quebec, there's the Kuwaitnik uh, Internet High School, where people don't have to leave their communities to graduate, but rather um, they'll have a class, like say a math class in one community. Um, everybody kind of connects through video conference. Um, they have like a virtual sort of school. And then another community might have a teacher there who specializes in, say, social studies, so everybody kind of tunes into that. Um, so they're able to get a full suite of um, high school classes that are taught, um, but people can still live in the communities and access that. And then business, right? So that's Tomasi Magnuic. Um, he runs Pernoma Technologies. It's a home-based internet business. And he's doing some amazing stuff up there. He created an Anuktitut uh, keyboard cover, so you could type in Anuktitut. Uh, he does graphic novels. Um, he does a lot of graphic design. And uh, even things like online training, showing people how to do uh, you know, things with uh, building in websites and stuff, and then he offers like online training from his home in Avuivik. So we're showing how people are using digital technologies. Here they're literally building it. So this is people connecting the internet. Um, in Nunavik, the, uh, the uh, Katavik regional government, which is the Inuit government, actually established their own regional internet service provider as a government service. And that kind of consists of, you see, you see the satellite dish there, and then you see the tower to the side. The satellite dish is how uh, you can connect the community to the rest of uh, the internet. So that's kind of what's called your point of presence, connecting the community to the rest of the world. Uh, and then that tower on the right is the wireless uh, tower that actually connects the home and businesses inside the community. Uh, and the fellow there, uh, that's um, Mosesi Adlak. He's a local technician that is actually in charge of uh, that local network. I always tell people, like, I can never complain about digging out my driveway anymore. He's showing how high the snow gets there. Uh, and that's the shed that, it, that has a lot of the equipment. So he digs that out. He does like a lot of the repair services, like that kind of stuff. He helps sign up customers. And he helps support that nonprofit internet service provider in his community. This kind of thing is also happening in other territories. So this is actually an image of the Northwest Territories. You see that red line there. That's a fiber optic cable called the Mackenzie Valley Fiber Link. Uh, and that's actually a fiber optic cable that connects all the communities. It offers another one of those points of presence in each of the communities in the Mackenzie Valley region. The challenge is that you don't have that local infrastructure. Remember I talked about the wireless connectivity up in Avuyevik? Um, oftentimes that's the missing uh, piece in some of these communities. Um, so I'm highlighting one there. This is uh, Katladeche First Nation near Hay River in the southern part of the territory. And you can see there, they're uh, actually trenching fiber optic cables themselves. So Lyle Fabian, who's a, a technology entrepreneur who lives up there, uh, put together a project where they actually uh, dug up and laid fiber optic cables, connected the uh, local public services, and then had Wi-Fi connections into people's homes. Um, you can see the kind of circumstances people are working in. Um, it, the ground got so hard and frozen that that trenching machine broke, and then they had to wait a full year until the ground softened enough to do it. They did it, they connected their community, and uh, had the fiber optic cables set there. Here's another example in uh, sort of a community. This is an Inuvialuit community uh, named Uluhaktuk, kind of in the far northern uh, region of Northwest Territories. And up there, there's a young lady named Sidone Okina, a 20-year-old who's actually spearheading a project to set up one of those local internet service providers. Uh, so her vision is to have a nonprofit internet uh, service provider to support connectivity in her community. Uh, so the CBC did a story about this project. Uh, she's working with a nonprofit uh, organization called Internet Society, sort of aims at um, building the internet around the world. Um, and in the article she said that this is important to me because for so many years we had really slow internet and really slow service. I've talked a lot about the far north. Um, this kind of activity is also happening right here in Alberta. Um, so I'll talk about a project in Masquachis, which is actually just a one hour drive south of here. Um, when you're driving down the number two, the Queen E Highway, um, you can turn on to Masquachis, you can go there. Um, they do not have connectivity there, right? So this is less than an hour outside of Edmonton and we're seeing this kind of challenge. 
Uh, Mascochise is home to four First Nations, Samson Cree, Ermanskin Cree, Louis Bull Nation, and the Montana Cree Nation. And there, there's a young, uh, young guy named Bruce Buffalo. Um, actually, uh, he's, he's nicknamed Broadband Bruce. So if you're interested, Al Jazeera did a documentary about him. So you can find it on YouTube. Just search for Broadband Bruce. Uh, and he set up a nonprofit called Mamawapuin Technology Society. Mamawapuin is a Cree word for gathering or the act of coming together. Right now, he's, he's servicing uh, for free. He's got free Wi-Fi access that people can access in his community. Um, there was a challenge there that you didn't have any cell phone service, you didn't have any internet. It was partly a safety challenge, you know, when people are out and about at night, there was no way to call for help. Um, so he's got free Wi-Fi that he's been delivering there. He's planning to expand to the other three First Nations within that area. Uh, so their mission statement at the Technology Society is that we believe that affordable internet access is key to enabling self-sufficiency and developing a thriving culture. We want to empower our communities to discover the future they can build with technology. Uh, so each of these people I've talked about, so you had Lyle and Kaladeche, you had Bruce and Masquichis, Sedone up in Uluhaktak, uh, Tomasi and, um, and uh, Mosesi up in Uvuyevik. They're helping provide that type of resilient infrastructure that will help people use technologies in ways that will deliver public services, help with community development, economic development. I talk about these four enabling conditions. So the first one is the access. How do you actually lay out the fiber, the physical infrastructure? How can people get that access to their communities? Availability is with respect to, can you actually phone up an internet service provider and get connected? That's not the case, right? You might have the infrastructure, who's actually operating it? Affordability, how's the cost of this? Is it actually affordable for people? And then adoption is issues around uh, digital literacy, you know, are people taking it up and using it in ways that are uh, useful to them or of interest to them? You could imagine in these communities the way to take up and use technology is much different than here in uh, Edmonton, right? It's uh, very different kind of context that people are working in. Um, so indigenous groups have also been involved in pushing policymakers to support those four areas of focus. Um, so I'll give one example here is, uh, I talked about the national regulator, the CRTC. They held hearings in 2016 that talked about should we make broadband um, available to everybody in Canada no matter where they live. Indigenous groups were a strong voice there pushing for um, the requirement to make it an essential service. Increase the speeds that are available to people, so 50 megabytes uh, per second down and 10 up. And also, um, how are you going to fund this? So they established a broadband fund that can be accessed by all types of organizations, including nonprofit and indigenous groups, so they can uh, support the kind of projects that I uh, talked about today. Uh, that fund is actually 0.1% uh, of the telecommunications company's revenues, which adds up over five years to $750 million. Uh, another area that Indigenous and Northern groups are involved in is with respect to the adoption of digital technologies. So one area is the Digital Literacy Exchange Program. Uh, so this is a government program that is funding uh, digital literacy training initiatives that are focused around um, the interests of people uh, within different contexts, whether it's an urban context in a city, whether it's a northern context uh, such as Avuyavik or in the Northwest Territories. Uh, so one of these initiatives is uh, Digital NWT, which is all about co-creating uh, digital literacy resources that uh, meet the needs of northern um, teachers and uh, students. Uh, so this is an initiative that is led by four of the um, indigenous tribal groups, um, land claim groups, um, as well as Aurora College and Aurora Research Institute. Uh, so it involves Aurora College adult educators that are helping develop digital literacy courses uh, that they will then go out and teach in their home communities. Um, and as part of the training to this, um, so I was involved in this initiative and we held some, uh, some training in uh, Inuvik uh, last um, August. That image on the top is kind of how we started it out where uh, you have like a ball of yarn and then you stand in a circle and toss it to one person, toss it to the next person while you hold the yarn and it essentially like makes a network of yarn so you're holding this thing. And the idea is that the internet is getting built by people, right, by people's actions, by you throwing it and then the other person catching it, that's making a connection in the internet. And also showing that at the end of the day, the internet is a connection between people, 
right? It's not about the technology, it's about the people who are involved in connecting through the internet and building it. Uh, and then another activity was going through the process of uh, creating digital stories about how people um, think about technology within their uh, daily lives. Uh, so people actually in one day went through a process of coming up with the idea for the story, uh, creating storyboards, uh, filming it, recording it, editing it, and then posting it on YouTube. And uh, if you're interested, if you visit digitalnwt.ca, you can see about 16 of these stories that people uh, ended up creating. And of course, people living in the north are also taking up and using the technologies in really innovative ways. Here are three examples of young people in the north. Christian Binder, he's an Inuvialuit photographer, and he does stuff using drone photography. So he's got just incredible images uh, all around the north. Uh, you can see there is the uh, Igloo Church in Inuvik. Below him is Tanya Larson. Uh, she does um, kind of jewelry out of uh, land-based materials. Uh, creates this really beautiful uh, uh, jewelry and then uses Instagram and, and her website and stuff to sell that all around the world. Uh, and then on the right is uh, JC Firth Hagen, uh, who's actually started a uh, hashtag speak Gwich'in to me, uh, which uses uh, Twitter, which uses Facebook, and uh, is aiming to reclaim uh, one of the most uh, endangered languages in Canada, Gwich'in. Uh, so she has things like the Gwich'in word of the day. She does like, um, you know, lessons online, that kind of stuff. So uh, just doing amazing work. So I encourage everybody to check out um, all of their uh, stuff and follow uh, Speak Gwich'in to me. Just going back to the sustainable development goal. So again, the, the focus is on building resilient infrastructure, promoting inclusive and sustainable industrialization and fostering innovation. And I just want to stress that behind this goal is the work of uh, people in the north who are really leading uh, Canada uh, in this area. So thank you very much.